must constantly look at things in a different way. The Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast was created by two physical therapists out of the desire to learn more about the different educational roles in physical therapy and healthcare and how healthcare education works by talking with educational leaders and people with different perspectives within physical therapy and across interdisciplinary lines on how education can be improved to disrupt the status quo of healthcare education. This is our journey and thanks for listening. Are you a third-year physical therapy student that excels on tests when you have study guides, checklists, and deadlines? With all of the information available about how to prepare for the NPTE, it's easy to get disorganized and not feel prepared going into the big day. NPTE Prep Success is an online course that provides PT students easy-to-use study guides and step-by-step guidance through the NPTE preparation. To learn more, visit kylericeprep.com. Thank you again all for your continued support, and now for the show. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. I'm your host, F. Scott Field, and as always, I'm joined by my co-host, Brandon Pone. And today, we have two amazing guests on the show to talk about the topic of hybrid learning and discussing the certification available through Evidence in Motion, or EIM. We're so grateful today to bring you Dr. Mark Shepard and Dr. Kendra Gagnon. Would you both mind telling us a little bit about your academic journeys and how they led you to where you both are today? Kendra, let's go ahead and start with you. Okay, so, um, you know, I graduated um, PT school in 2001 and just a few years out of PT school, um, I'm a pediatric physical therapist, um, decided I thought I wanted to teach. And so I found my way to um, the PhD program at the University of Kansas Medical Center. So I started there working on my PhD in 2005. I was a graduate teaching assistant. So I started kind of helping out in the labs kind of in that capacity. Um, At that time, that was their first um, DPT cohort. I was there as their first DPT cohort went through and KU didn't have a pediatrics faculty member at the time. And so um, kind of there I was working on my PhD and um, had pediatrics expertise. And so I sort of got handed this, um, hey, why don't you teach this course? But there was nothing... um, you know, there uh, as far as content. And so I just sort of had to jump in there and uh, figure it out and find my way. So I did that um, and just found that I was really passionate about teaching. Um, And so, you know, so from there, um, I um, taught at the University of Kansas then for through 2014. I went to Rockhurst University for three years, which is just across town in Kansas City. Um, Taught there for a few years as well, and then um, learned about the program at South College, the hybrid two-year DPT program at South College, um, was um, kind of tapped to come in and help develop and teach that pediatric content for the first time. Um, I was super intrigued by it, wasn't that sure about it, um, but the model made sense to me. Um, it was just a great, great time. Um, and so I ended up, um, at that time, I was sort of in the right place at the right time. And the Baylor program was up and starting to run and starting to um, bring in um, their faculty. And so I jumped on faculty and there I am now. So now I'm um, at the Baylor DPT program um, in their hybrid uh, program. I've been there for about a year now. So, and we brought in our first class of students in January. Awesome. Awesome. Mark, how about you? Yeah, so I um, I went to uh, undergrad. I went to James Madison University, so uh, not too far from from you, Brandon, in uh, Harrisonburg, Virginia, and that's really where my passion for physical therapy started. Um, and then I uh, I moved on to Sacred Heart University up in in Fairfield, Connecticut, with my DPT. Graduated there in 2010. And that's really, I think, where, uh, you know, I was really just lucky to be around people who just exuded leadership in in education. You know, I I was lucky enough to be under, you know, kind of the instruction and mentorship of Dr. Pam Levangie, um, who was at Sacred Heart at the time. And and the program was problem-based learning. So we had these tutorials, group-based learning, case-based learning. And I just couldn't get enough of the way that we really stimulated us to be lifelong learners and learn. So luckily, my final year as a DPT student, I was able to be what we called a tutorial leader where you you led these groups um, and guided them through. So it was just so cool because you got to work as a facilitator and be a guide on the side versus a sage on the stage. And that just had me hooked. 
Um, so my second part is, uh, you know, I graduated and then I knew I wanted to do post-professional residency fellowship. Like I, I knew I wanted to do it, but I didn't want to have to move all the way across the country at the time. There was only a limited amount of residency programs. You know, I was engaged. Um, you know, my, my fiance was outside of Baltimore and, you know, I knew that's where I had to go. Um, and so I, I plopped into evidence and motions, um, programming went, ended up going through the fellowship training and, you know, I was really skeptical about hybrid learning and really ended up loving it. It was just awesome to allow me to meet my own professional goals. Um, so, you know, as I built my passion for clinical care, which is in musculoskeletal, uh, persistent pain and spine is kind of my uh, niche, if you will. Um, I really started to develop this side of me that really wanted to teach and have that kind of relationship with individuals like I did in uh, the environment I was in at Sacred Heart. And so, you know, EIM being the way it is and having the, the best leaders around, they really helped, you know, foster these opportunities. So uh, in 2015, I was, you know, lucky enough, uh, Julie Whitman got, got me hooked up uh, with some opportunities at South College. And I've been teaching as core faculty there since that time and have also had the opportunity to be a PTA program director for a developing program in Tampa, Florida, another hybrid program um, that I'm stepping out of the leadership role there to take on more leadership roles actually in the fellowship program. So that's kind of my journey and, and I'm blessed to be able to do a little bit of clinical care, teaching, and hopefully now starting to get into a little bit more research. I love it, guys. And I really think it's interesting how you both had kind of mentioned throughout your stories within that a lot of you, you both had this kind of this resistance initially to hybrid learning, but then the more you guys got into it, the more you kind of really saw the value in it. So before we kind of dive into that topic a little bit, let's, let's start with some context here. How would you guys define for our audience what exactly is hybrid learning and what it entails? So that's a great question. And I think there's still, um, it's new enough that I think there's still some um, discussion in the profession and in the field over what hybrid learning really is. And so I'll kind of share a little bit of kind of what we, how sort of we define it and sort of our perspectives on it. So, I mean, of course, I think most people really kind of understand um, online learning pretty well. I mean, learning that happens um, in, in an online environment I think that a lot of times when people think about that online learning, they, they immediately think about, you know, just posted, you know, voiceover lectures, maybe some readings, like kind of more of an asynchronous content. And so I think in, you know, what blended or hybrid learning does is it, it, is it utilizes that. It utilizes that online, those, um, you know, computer-based, those web-based materials, but also incorporates face-to-face -face learning. And so I think, you know, so the question is, you know, a lot of people use the terms hybrid and online or excuse me, hybrid and blended learning interchangeably. Um, but there are some folks in the field that think there's maybe a little subtle difference and that blended learning is really more about creating those online asynchronous activities between face to face sessions. So kind of flipped learning. If you think about the flipped classroom, that would be sort of a type of blended learning, whereas hybrid really focuses on. Um, replacing some of that face-to-face -face interaction with really high quality virtual experiences that may also be synchronous, that may be a live classroom as well. And so that's sort of another sort of piece of things that I think surprises people when we start talking about it, that when we talk about this hybrid learning model, we're not just talking about posting lectures and um, you know, readings for students to work through on their own, and then they come to class or they come to lab, we have live classes that occur online in a virtual environment. And really, when it comes down to it, I think that, um, you know, what hybrid learning really does is it really uh, you just, it's, it's really just good teaching. And, you know, you may, some of, some of the listeners may have read a blog post I wrote for EIM just about, I think about a month ago, um, and the title was called Hybrid Learning Isn't That Special. And it's really not. I mean, good teaching and learning is good teaching and learning. And so I think when we think about really good hybrid teaching and learning, what we're doing is we're taking best teaching practices and we're just leveraging technology to figure out how best to use both virtual and face-to-face -face time. So when we need to be face-to-face, -face, butts in seats, 
or, or moving around a classroom and interacting, that's when we're doing that. But when things can happen online, we can do those things synchronously or asynchronously. And that's really where, what hybrid learning is. And it's obviously that, you know, the technologies that we use are still evolving. So it's still evolving and which is a really exciting thing about it. Um, but, but that's really, I, th I think kind of when we start thinking about the difference between talking about online blended and hybrid learning, that's where those differences lie. I don't know if Mark has, has anything to add to that. No, I think I just w would love to echo the point that, you know, teaching is teaching, right? Good teaching is, is going to happen in any environment, whether you're brick and mortar or digital learning. And I think, you know, that's the, the big piece here is that, you know, the, the things we're doing at EIM, we're not really innovating a ton, right? Digital learning has been around for since the 90s. I mean, since the internet has been around. I mean, it's just been slow to hit the healthcare market because it is such a dynamic, hands-on, interpersonal type of environment. And people just think that can't happen. Well, it does happen. What happens on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat, every, I mean, we interact with people just as much online as we do in real face-to-face -face environments. We're just leveraging the technology to, to maximize the interactions in the modern world. And I think, you know, this hybrid learning piece, you know, gets the, the digital online face gets a lot of this attention. But we focus so much time in this certification program, really talking about how we can change the face-to-face -face environment to be better. And, and we look at that as immersive labs, at least in the physical therapy domain, these immersive labs. You know, you're not coming to labs for two and a half hours where you waste the first 30 minutes getting situated. And, and, and we all have been in labs where, you know, there's lecture happening. Why is lecture happening in lab? Lab should be movement. We put the physical and physical therapy in these immersive labs. We're not sitting around passively. It's active learning from the moment you get in there to the moment you leave. And, and really, really like to see the certification blending both the face-to-face -face and the online so that we can train folks to be clinicians because guess what? We're not in the clinic for two and a half hours at a time. We're in the clinic for eight hours and you got to be going. We're physical therapists. We're moving around, you know, so we... We really think the hybrid piece is not just digital, but it's also that face-to-face -face learning. It's especially the face-to-face -face learning. And what I think is the most fun about it is, you know, I used to say when I was in traditional academia a lot, and um, when we'd start talking about the curriculum, I used to say, why don't we think about this? You know, we'd make all these little changes in the curriculum and just do this and that. But I'd say, what if we, if we could take it apart and put it back together again, what would it look like? You know? And, and that's what we've done in, I mean, that's really what's happening in some of these new hybrid models. We took it apart and put it back together in a way that's really intentional, that focuses on good teaching and learning and, you know, that's, that emphasizes the pedagogy and then just really says, okay, what things need to happen in class? What things need to happen live? What things need to happen in person? What things can happen virtually? Um, and it's really, you know, no pun intended, but kind of the perfect blend of all of that to make, um, make education as efficient and effective, I think, as it can possibly be. Yeah, Kendra, I think you hit the nail on the head there. And, and I actually had the pleasure of doing a little bit of adjunct work with Baylor this past weekend. And I, I have to say, you guys really impressed me with the way that things were done in the face-to-face um, and, and you could really see throughout this semester, the stuff that needed to be online was done online and the stuff that needed to be done in face to face situations was done in face to face. So, I mean, it was a really, really efficient weekend. I was, I was pleasantly surprised with, with how things are progressing at Baylor's DPT program, but let's talk a little bit about the certification program you guys are talking about. What drove you both to work on this certification and, and hybrid learning? Yeah, I think really where I came into um, this, again, relates to kind of my journey uh, getting into education and academics. Um, you know, again, it was this idea behind problem-based learning, um, you know, which isn't really a, a mainstay in a lot of schools, but elements of it are definitely within a, a bunch of different programs out there. But I love the ability for, for students to actively engage and, and not feel like we're going to lecture to, to sit in uh, a seat and, you know, basically just tune out for, for a number of, uh, you know, hours as it is in lecture. And, you know, I think a lot of the criticism with online education is that we're passively doing the same thing online when, in fact, as, as Kendra mentioned, you know, we're having live classes just like we would any other time, except we're using the digital realm to actually do active learning, to, to stimulate, do, you know, formative 
um, or actually summative types of assessments that we can really kind of get a pulse check for how students are doing. And, you know, hybrid, you know, drew me the, the, the model and, and the, the, the theories behind why it could be effective drew me to that um, approach. So I, I think that is a piece. And then the hybrid also allows for the ability to accelerate the curriculum. And I think that um, was of interest to me because of this whole tuition inflation and how much debt people are coming out with. I mean, it's just not sustainable. I mean, physical therapy is going to, you know, just not be what it could if we have students coming out with this much. And, and that really, you know, leads to future talks about post-professional and where that can go. But I'm just very passionate about how can we, we really start to progress education forward given the modern era era and and how can we you know accelerate things in a way that we can hopefully uh, reduce debt on students and and get them to potentially uh, look at post-professional training a little bit easier than they would now yeah and I think for me you know I spent several years in traditional academia as I mentioned earlier I really started sort of educating DPT students in 2005 um, and was in, uh, you know, traditional kind of brick and mortar PT programs through 2014. And those were both wonderful programs. And, you know, I can't say enough about all the things I learned there and the wonderful experiences I had there. But I can't help but also, you know, I, I couldn't help but sort of have this feeling, um, number one, especially as I started getting towards, you know, this, you know, to, uh, you know, 2015, 14, 2013, you know, I was sitting there thinking, you know, I've been out of PT school now. Uh, about you know, 15 years and we're still kind of teaching students in the exact same way that we were teaching them. You know, PT school didn't look that different. You know, we'd moved to the doctorate so there were more classes, there's more stuff happening, there was more time, but, but in the end, you know, it was still lectures and labs and really traditional and it, I couldn't help just see that disconnect between these enormous changes that were happening in society with the way information is kind of created and shared online with, you know, enormous advances in technology where we all now carry small computers in our pocket and most people have access to high speed internet um, and video um, streaming is available and all of these things are just widely available now and we have all these changes were happening, um, but academia and education hadn't changed that much. And so that disconnect, I have to be really honest, started to make me feel a little bit frustrated um, and a little bit restless. And so I just felt like um, again, feeling that disconnect between what was happening and what was possible. And so when I started to sort of learn about this hybrid learning model, and then we started talking about, you know, the, the you know, unique challenges that might be facing educators who try to teach in this model and how we need to support those people. I mean, it just seemed like, yes, this is what needs to be happening. This is how we can close that gap um, and start to move us forward and, and also sort of, you know, reconnect um, educators with, again, what's possible, I think. Yeah, I think that's a really important point. You know, obviously, of course, with anything, you guys have mentioned a ton of the pros behind hybrid learning. But, you know, let's step back a little bit and let's play devil's advocate here because we always like to do that on this show. So what are some of the pros of hybrid learning that you guys haven't already mentioned? And what are the cons of hybrid learning when it comes to educating either current or aspiring healthcare providers? Yeah, so I mean, it's, you know, certainly not going to, um, you know, there are pros and of course there are cons, there are opportunities and there are challenges, but I still think, and maybe you're starting to like get this theme here between Mark and I as we, and you're starting to kind of understand our philosophy that when we put the hybrid part front and center, um, I think it kind of misses the point because I think there are pros and cons obviously of um, sort of any educational model. Good teaching is good teaching, whether it happens in a classroom, um, in a lab, in a, a, you know, a virtual environment and bad teaching is bad teaching wherever it happens. And now that I've kind of spent time in a lot of worlds on both entry level, post-professional, online, you know, hybrid, um, a traditional, I've seen good teaching and bad teaching in all of those environments. And so, you know, my, you know, my philosophy is that, you know, a lot of times people will talk about, you know, the learning curve with the technology and some of those kinds of things. But again, when te the technology is used well and it's supporting good educational practices, the technology fades into the background. And so, uh, you know, that said, there are unique challenges in supporting students in a virtual environment. I'm the director of student affairs in our program. And so, um, and that's been a really super fun job to me, for me to get to think about how do you get to support students 
for, from 22 different states that are in our, our Baylor program. You know, they're not walking into the classroom. You don't see, you can't see their face that, you know, something going on. Um, and so we have to be really intentional about um, actually supporting those students. You know, we create, um, you know, we have a really unique system we use for advising, you know, I, I, and really I feel incredibly connected with my students, maybe even more so than I felt in traditional environments because I think we're so intentional um, about that. So, you know, we have to, you know, those unique challenges we face, again, kind of humanizing the online learning environment, um, making sure that we're creating a social presence in those online experiences. You know, I don't know that I would call those cons, but there's certainly opportunities and there's certainly places that are really easy to screw up if you're not really intentional about thinking about how are we gonna really humanize this um, because when what you try to do with a model like this, if you just do substitution level, if you just say, oh, I'm just going to take this class I've always taught before and just repackage it online, you're going to screw up. You're not going to, you know, it's not going to be humanized. The students are going to be frustrated. They're not going to feel that presence. But when you build processes to really support students specific to this environment, it, it works really, really well. Yeah. And I would add, you know, this, this type of environment really instills the you know behaviors of being self-motivated, uh, becoming organized, focused, and and really it builds uh, a certain sense of uh, cognitive endurance, if you will. Um, you know, so if you're not really great at working at these, you know, it can be a challenging environment. And then put on top of that, it's accelerated. You know, you're going to have to make behavior change happen at a much faster pace than you would maybe in any type of traditional, just for example, a PT program. But I think if you think about what we're trying to instill from a cultural standpoint, from a, um, from a professional standpoint, I mean, we're trying to instill these behaviors in, in folks when they go out to become new graduates. So, you know, it is a challenge in this type of program. But I would say it's also an opportunity in the way it is, is it builds professionalism. This is, this is the hidden curriculum, right? This is the hidden curriculum. So I think that piece, you know, if you have the support for it, it can, you can really develop something uh, in a real magical way that, you know, there's classes, you know, classes dedicated to, but we just train people. That's our culture in these programs. So I think that's kind of my take on, on some of the pros, maybe becoming cons and vice versa. Yeah, I think that's really important. And, you know, something that I've heard also in regards to kind of just different models of education is that some kids, some students ultimately are going to do better in a hybrid model. Some are ultimately going to do better in a traditional brick and mortar setting. And, you know, that's just learning styles and personal preferences. And some people just do better in certain ones compared to the other. And yeah, knowing thyself. And I guess my question to you guys is how is the best way that we can start to triage or identify at an early standpoint, who's going to do well in hybrid, who's going to do well in a traditional brick and mortar setting, you know, how can we best identify those people and kind of set them up for success early on so that they can make the best, have the best educational experience and ultimately do the best for our patients? Yeah. So I'll, I'm going to start by answering that question by kind of challenging that assumption a little bit that there's the right, you know, that there is a right fit. And I, you know, it's a whole, probably a podcast for a whole other day, but I, I sort of have some, um, I don't know if you use the word, but a lot of times there's the word of what's the right fit for students. And, you know, I get concerned when we start using that word that we start, you know, that threatens diversity and things like that. And so, and I also will say that it's interesting that you brought up learning styles because as I was thinking about, um, as I think about this, I think that um, thinking about whether our program is the right quote unquote fit um, for students is a lot like kind of the learning styles myth which is really a myth that's been perpetuated in education that, you know, that we definitely know people have preferences about the way they learn, but there's no evidence that actually supports learning styles in that, you know, instructors teaching differently makes a difference to different learners, you know, instructors teaching to learning styles. And so we don't know enough about hybrid education yet to know, but my guess is that um, there certainly may be that, that, that my guess is that the evidence probably parallels that. So my guess is that there are probably students who um, prefer or think they prefer to sit in a classroom and get a lecture versus, versus sitting in a virtual classroom or listening to it online. Um, but I'm not convinced that there's really a program type that's a, that's the right, again, quote unquote, fit 
for a certain student. So, you know, again, I think that um, if hybrid teaching and learning is well designed, it's collaborative, it's learner centered and inclusive, that instructors are responsive and they are it's, you know, using best teaching practices, I think that our, that a hybrid model can be a really great option for a lot of students, most if not many. If it's, if it's poorly um, executed, it's not going to be a good model for a lot of our students. And so, you know, I also think that this is a great opportunity to talk a little bit about how our model and the high, I say our model, but talking about the hybrid model of education um, that we use at Baylor and that's used at South as well can really improve access, including diversity. You know, I think that our students, you know, our students come from 22 states. We're about a third ethnic and racial minority in our first cohort at Baylor. We have students, we have a, a large number of first generation college students, a lot of students who are from rural areas. And the reality is, is that those students would simply not have access to a program, to PT education, if it weren't for the hybrid model allowing them to access it. And so, um, so I think that, uh, you know, a really, big piece of this to me is that it really allows us to, um, you know, make DPT education accessible to populations that are, um, that are the very populations that we are, we're really trying to reach not only in, in terms of our providers and in term, but it also in terms of providing care. And so that's something that really excites me um, about our model. Yeah. And I would say too, you know, you look at you know, the students coming through undergrad, I mean, we are steeped in traditional models of education. I mean, I would say the vast majority of people coming into healthcare have probably only had brick and mortar style, you know, butts and seats, you're sitting in, you're listening to a lecture, you go home, you do your homework, and then, you know, rinse rather, you know, uh, do it again, repeat, 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 you know, it's just one of those things that I think it's just, challenging sometimes to, to change the status quo. But I mean, that's what we're doing as physical therapists. We're trying to change the face of healthcare as it is. And I think this, this model helps really, really change that. And, and so for a lot of students, it is a behavior change to switch, like we talked about earlier, to become more self-motivated, organized, and focused. But again, those are the very behaviors we want to see in our students going forward. And, and I think that will really you know, help students become better. And I, I can't agree with Kendra more in, in the thought that, you know, this, there, there's a, not a perfect student for this thing. There's many students who can benefit from this. It's, it's not the technology. It's not the delivery. It's a faculty. If faculty are truly bring, bringing in collaborative, learner-centered, and inclusive care that really gets at diversity, I mean, isn't that what the APTA has been talking about for years? I mean, in, in my mind, we are trying to make the future happen now. The future in my world is present. And, and I look to Apple and I think about Steve Jobs and what, what was the quote he said? You know, I, I try to give people what they want before they even know they want it. Like, like how cool is that to be part of this thing? And, and I kind of laugh sometimes because I go to CSM and I hear these talks about, you know, where education is going. And I'm like, dude, it's here. It's here. Like, let's do this. And that's what's exciting, you know, and I think that's what, what will make this thrive is that physical therapists in particular, we're ready to embrace this. We've been talking about it. Let's jump on the bandwagon and let's collaborate and make it happen. Especially and especially since students are probably really loving it too, based on, again, getting back to earlier discussion of regards to finances too and accessibility. And I love how you kind of mentioned kind of the behavior change overall of students and academics contributing, but also making sure that the quality of hybrid teaching and finding the right faculty is equally important in that as well. So I think those were some very good, solid, clarifying points that should have, that need to have been covered for sure. So guys, you know, in developing the certification program, what were some of the barriers that you faced and had to overcome when, you know, really looking at the program's inception all the way up to its current level at certification? Yeah. So I think, um, you know, when we look at inception of the program, I have to give a shout out to uh, Dr. Tim Notaboom, who is a program director now of South College, but he kind of took this on underneath his own wings to try to um, get a structure and get a sense of um, what this would look like. And, you know, Tim has a, a great background in, in, and an awesome perspective on hybrid learning you know, with his experience at Regis and, and, you know, carrying that forward now into South College. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, uh, of, of this program, we can really say that Tim helped stimulate there. 
uh, from here, you know, Kendra and I came together and we really just started putting our, our thoughts together on what this looks like. And, and our goal was really to, you know, balance theory and in the trenches uh, practice. You know, I'm, I'll, I'll be the first to admit that I'm not, you know, a very well-known, um, you know, educator or anything like that. I haven't been practicing, you know, in academ academics for, you know, 30 years like some of the greats in our profession have. Um, but, you know, I've been in the trenches enough to know, you know, what kind of works and what may not work. And, and Kendra has, you know, the historical perspective working in, in traditional models. She has a great framework of the theory behind things. And we just brought those two together. So some of the barriers was really just figuring out how can we balance those? You know, you look at evidence-based practice and how do we balance the literature with, with balancing it with what patient preference uh, preferences and then your own experiences, you know, we tried to, to bring that forward in this program. Um, so, you know, with that being said, um, and Kendra alluded to this earlier, there's really not a lot of evidence to help guide us here. A lot of the evidence is coming from, you know, the nursing field, which obviously is, is there's some carryover there, but when you look at external validity here, there's really not that says anything that says that, oh, this is perfect, you should follow this um, type of algorithm or approach, um, you know, all the way through. So we, it was a lot of, you know, trimming down the evidence to help guide us in a way that, that, that meshes well with best practice, that meshes well with um, best evidence and meshes well with what happens in the, the teaching trenches, if you will. Yeah. And I would say too, you know, in, in healthcare academia, um, healthcare providers that, that go into academics, you know, we often don't learn to teach. You know, we come into teaching in healthcare because of our content expertise, you know, because, you know, I, I wanted to teach pediatric PT, but I never learned to teach. And I think I, you know, talked a little bit in my intro about, you know, how I, how I came in as a graduate uh, teaching assistant as a PhD student and was kind of like, okay, you get to teach the pediatrics course now, which I was super excited about, but I didn't even know how to write a learning objective. Like I'd never, I'd never done that. I, I knew about being a pediatric PT and I was learning more about, you know, practice and research and science as a PhD student. But, um, but you know, I'm not really, you know, we, I hadn't really learned about education and healthcare educators don't often learn to teach. And so one of the big things that we really are looking at in this um, certif certification as well is bringing in these providers that often have a ton of content expertise and actually saying, okay, now it's time to learn about the craft of teaching and not get so bogged down in your content that we're really learning about, we're thinking about best teaching. And again, that just also hangs on what we've talked about earlier about how it's not about the hybrid part. It's about good teaching and learning. And so if we have good teaching and learning practices, um, then, you, then you can layer in that content expertise and create something that's really, really special. And that's what we're really trying to help these educators do. Yeah, Kendra, and I don't know the general direction that we're heading when it comes to, to DPT education, but you know, I'm working on an educational doctorate, and I can say that as difficult as it is, and as much as I may not promote it or, or make you know, request that anybody actually do that, uh, the educational doctorate is a phenomenal mm -hmm. amount of work for learning how we teach and how we learn and, and the literal transfer of knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, for anybody looking to become a better teacher, I would say the EDD has a lot of great didactic work behind it. It is difficult, uh, you know, just as any terminal degree is, mm -hmm. but um, that is one direction that I think students should look into if they want to become better teachers and learn the craft of actually teaching and educating. Uh, again, it's very difficult. I don't recommend it, you know, to just anybody, but uh, it is an option for, for students who are looking to get into academia and, and really do want to be better teachers. And, and I will say that my curriculum uh, development has gotten, you know, from zero to a hundred after that program. And, and like I said, it, it's been great didactic work. Um, it's just not necessarily something that a lot of DP, DPT students think about right off the bat when it comes to terminal degrees. I think a lot of times, like you said, they go right into the content uh, and their specialty, which is fine as well. You, you know, you just have to know yourself and know which direction you want to head. Uh, I'm still trying to figure that out, but one of these days I'll get there, I'm sure. 
Well, that's the point of us doing this podcast, man. That's part of the, that's part of the mission. Not all of it, but that's a big part of it. And, yeah. you know, Mark, I know you had mentioned earlier about kind of more some of the evidence, how you took some of the evidence on kind of this from nursing and a few others. So, you know, I know there's probably a lot of studies on this that you guys look through, but overall, what does the overall evidence say about hybrid learning from what you guys had researched? And what are some of the big limitations of this data and where we, the research needs to go next to answer some of those remaining questions, if there are any? Yeah, it's, uh, you know, it's a great question. I'm glad you, you brought this up. And, you know, I was listening to one of your podcasts earlier with uh, Eric Mira, and he was, you know, I thought he did a great job kind of talking about evidence as it related to, to knee pain. And, and, and really, you could extrapolate to everything, right? It's like, oh, what's, it, what's the famous line in every conclusion? More research is needed, right? Um, and so that's kind of, you know, what we're seeing as well in this educational model with hybrid uh, evidence. But there, there's an article um, from 2015. It's a Nugent new, new uh, et al., published this, um, and, and they really were talking about, you know, what's the, the evidence say up to this point on effectiveness of, of the hybrid approach. And the bottom line is this, around 92% of the data um, that's out there, at least in, by 2015 or a little bit before, has showed that at least, um, you know, the hybrid models are about as effective, um, if not a little bit more than brick and mortar. About 3% of the research that's out there says that it's not as effective as brick and mortar. And then about the other 4% says it's a mixed bag. You know, there's some that say yeah, some that say no. You know, the repeatability of this stuff is obviously, you know, something to be cautious of. So I would, I would caution that, you know, there's, there's a lot of these meta-analyses um, are including studies earlier on that, that may have poor methodology um, and it's getting better, but I think, you know, when we look at this, it's kind of like what happened with low back pain when we first started researching this in the clinical uh, research domain is that there were so many heterogeneous studies out there. It was really hard to define what hybrid education was. You know, there's so many components of hybrid, hybrid education. There's asynchronous types, there's synchronous types of activities, um, you know, testing, what are the outcomes? There's so much there. So, you know, I liken it to kind of like doing uh, research on just exercise, right? You know, if we're looking at exercise for a given outcome, you know, what kind of exercise are we talking about here? Are we talking about aerobic exercise? Are we talking about power, endurance training? What, what aspect there are we talking about? So we really have to break down hybrid education um, to understand the different components that fall into that. And again, it goes back to Kendra's point. Teaching is teaching is teaching. Good theory is good theory. So I think, you know, we look at hybrid kind of and put it on a pedestal, if you will. But I think if we extrapolate just good teaching theory and good skill, best practice, I would say you can, you can layer that into to hybrid education. And I'm sure you would start to see some carry over there. I do think hybrid teaching and learning, um, especially a lot of the synchronous type classroom experiences, it's so, the technology is so new and we all know what a lag there is between, you know, from research actually being done to getting published. And so I think there's, there's very little out there. I mean, and so that's definitely something that we have to remember. And what is out there is largely um, research on undergraduate. There's a little bit on graduate education. There's hardly anything in PT. There's a few little studies out there about, you know, kind of flipping the classroom and real, you know, specific sort of uh, blended learning experiences. But as you know, but there's not a whole lot out there. I mean, I do think though that, and as Mark just said, and as we've kind of said over and over again, you know, I suspect that the hybrid part isn't what makes the teaching and learning better or not anyway. I think, um, as we've said, the quality um, the, uh, of the educators, the, the training of educators, you know, being really intentional about using good teaching practices, those are all of the things that are just really, really important. And the research is challenging to do too, especially now, because be just because there's a variety of types of programs out there, um, even as we start to study them, and we are, we're starting to collect data on our students and outcomes, um, we do have to recognize that it's a pretty small number and it's also a, a self-selected group, right? It's a self-selected group, not only of students and faculty who are kind of going to this program now, you know, we're not 
taking a group of DPT applicants and randomizing them and saying, okay, you're going to go to a hybrid program and you're going to go to a, you're going to go to a brick and mortar program. We're going to see what happens. I mean, so this, there, there is, there's certainly going to be limitations to the research that said, I do think the research does support a set of emerging. Um, I don't know if I want to call them best practices, but at least recommended practices, you know, that are essential for hybrid learning and online learning. You know, you have to create a sense of community and social presence. Um, you have to humanize the experience. You have to build that community. Um, you have to provide prompt feedback. We've probably all taken an online class sometime that makes us feel a little, you know, we're worried about online education where we felt like there was just like this robot on the other side. The instructor never jumped in the discussion board. They never, who is this person? You know, you would get the, you might get announcements, but they were obviously scheduled at midnight every Sunday night. So it wasn't even a real person, you know, scheduling those they are actually sending those out. Students need to feel like there's a real human person on the other side. And there's, and when you do that, when you create the presence, you create that sense of community, um, you are, you give prompt feedback, um, and timely feedback, uh, in kind of posting and you're engaged. Those are when you get really good learning outcomes. And so I do think that we are starting to come to con some consensus on what are some good kind of recommended practices when teaching in this model. Yeah, those are great points. Um, I'd like to get down to the nuts and bolts of the certification program, if you guys don't mind. I mean, what does the certification program in hybrid learning consist of? And, you know, how long does it take to complete approximately? Yeah, so the hybrid learning certificate um, right now, it, there are three courses. Um, the first course is self-paced. It's a four-week self-paced course. It's really kind of setting the stage, lots of sort of reading, reading and learning um, about just kind of hybrid teaching and learning, to, reading some of the research we're citing and talking about here and starting to think about some of those things. Um, the second course is an eight-week instructor-led course. Um, there's no synchronous classes we, it's all asynchronous, but it is, we are kind of all tracking along at the same time. Um, what's really fun about it, I think, is that in that course, we really get into the nitty gritty. We start, we write objectives, we create content, we start using different technology to support best teaching practices. But the kicker is we don't let our learners um, create content related to their expertise, area of expertise. So we make them, we require that they choose an area, a topic that's totally unrelated. So we have our learners will create content around things like making salsa, um, painting trim, reading the body language of a cat, you know, some of this sort of silly topics because what we really try to emphasize is the, the concept of writing good objectives, creating good content, building a really good rubric. It doesn't matter what the topic is, right? So, so that's sort of what we do. So it's a lot of learning. It's a lot of application. It's a ton of interaction and feedback. Mark and I are in there all the time. Um, and I think it's really serious fun. So course two is probably my personal favorite. And then in course three, it's a six week um, and it is an instructor led course, but it's a lot less structure than the second course. It's, um, it's more of a um, practicum. And so we really have all of our learners then sort of get now, now you take what you've learned in these first two courses, apply it to your content. So now it's time for you to pick a project. And we really try to have people pick projects, you know, things that they're really teaching. So it's helpful for them that they're doing work that, that is, they're doing work in the course that's, that they'll be able to translate to their real life teaching. Um, so create a, take a module or a topic um, and build some content around that. And again, that's um, a lot less structured because they're very individualized projects, but we are there providing um, feedback, lots of peer feedback, um, and so it's, it's really a lot of great fun. Um, you know, our, our learners don't need any sort of special kind of equipment. I mean, a regular laptop will do. We don't use any technology that's crazy or expensive. I mean, we try to use things that's just kind of relat um, readily available to educators. Most of our platforms um, are, are, that we use are free or, or very inexpensive or things that we have access to, um, you know, through EIM or through our institutions. Um, and it's just all about sort of, again, grounded in that really good pedagogy and teaching expertise, but then using technology, leveraging technology um, and virtual environments to kind of make that happen. Um, I think, you know, like we talked about before, um, a lot of healthcare educators don't really learn to teach. They know a lot about content, but they sort of learn to teach by just doing and mentorship and accident. Um, and so I think that, you know, that this allows 
um, educators to really put some intention around their teaching. And so, you know, we've gotten feedback from our learners, from people who have hardly taught at all, to people who have taught for 20 or 30 years that kind of go, oh man, this is, you know, I, I hardly ever have time to really think about how I'm putting this together. How I'm thinking about the content, but really thinking about the pedagogy and delivery or getting a lot of real intentional feedback from other educators um, isn't something that I often get to do. And so those are things that we really try to prioritize um, in the certification. So um, I think you asked how long it takes. So all told, um, it's about a um, let's see, it's four weeks, then eight weeks, then six weeks. So you can kind of do the math, but it's about kind of a five month process or so um, to get through all three courses. Yeah, I think that's great. And especially with, you know, you guys kind of going through this now and some, based on some of the feedback that you had just mentioned that you kind of received there, what are some of the changes that you guys anticipate in regards to this learning hybrid program that you both have kind of created? I think um, I'll let Kendra kind of talk a little bit on on the vision of what we see happening. But, you know, I think when we look at the field as it is now, there's really not a lot of faculty development uh, programs out there. So, you know, we, we really are passionate about, you know, building that craft and faculty. You know, obviously, this is uh, more specified in, in utilizing the hybrid model. And we know that Duke has a, a good residency that they have going on for faculty, which I think is awesome that we're starting to see some of that come along. But really, there's not a ton out there, you know, that, that we can look at developing junior faculty and even some of the, the higher level senior faculty who have been around a while. So I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to grow in that way. And, and I think as, as we look at hybrid kind of coming in and becoming the mainstay within healthcare education, I think there's a lot of opportunity for us to look beyond just physical therapy, occupational therapy. You know, we're, we're looking at a number of different professions that are, are, are thinking about hybrid. And there's a lot of interprofessional kind of opportunities and collaboration I think we can really look at there. Yeah, I agree. I think, you know, as, as Mark really just said, I mean, I think that this program kind of fills a gap that's there right now. I mean, with um, hybrid um, learning being fairly new, there aren't a lot of opportunities for professional development for educators kind of specific to thinking about hybrid learning. And so what happens often is, um, you know, if whether it's doing kind of a more of a blended learning, you know, flipped classroom kind of thing, but, you know, sometimes it's, you know, the, the assumption is maybe, oh, you're, you've taught for 20 years. Um, you know, here's this course you've taught. Um, why don't you just put it online? You know, boom, easy, you know, and what people don't realize is that again, you have to really repackage it in a way that's really intentional of thinking about how best to deliver this content, how to use different virtual tools, um, how to be face to face, um, and what to do when you're face to face, you know, how to use that time really, really well, because face to face time becomes so precious. Um, in these models. And so, um, you know, I think that that's really, you know, kind of the big focus right now. But again, you know, I'm a, I'm a dreamer and a thinker. And, um, and, you know, so of course, I start to look, you know, 25 steps ahead and thinking about possibilities of, you know, developing, you know, educational residencies and fellowships, maybe specific to um, hybrid teaching and learning, um, you know, building resources, you know, webinars and other sort of um, professional, you know, post professional education, you know, that, maybe are, you know, one-off kind of webinars or courses you can take without going through the whole certificate or people who have already gone through the certificate being able to come in and um, kind of continue that education um, and, you know, teach and learn in those different topics. So um, I think there's, again, it's, um, it's sort of uncharted territory at this point. There's not really a lot out there yet. And so I think as we move forward, we'll learn, we'll learn from, from our learners, what they need um, and what we, what we need to kind of continue to make folks feel supported in teaching and learning in these environments, and we'll just continue to um, evolve to fill those to fill those gaps and meet those needs. Yeah, I love it. I love the vision, you guys. Um, I'd like to kind of take a left turn here for a minute and go a different direction. Uh, but at the time of this recording, there was approximately 230 DPT programs in the nation. And they're estimating maybe another 50 or so that are looking to achieve accreditation over the next year or two. How do you think this plays out in the long run? I mean, is this a beneficial thing or a negative thing? And will we even be able to staff all these programs moving forward? Yeah, you know, that's, that's a great question. You know, this, this has come up in, in so many ways. And, and, you know, there's been talks on this and um, a lot of passionate discussion. And, and my thought is, you know, the, the two-year model of DPT education is here and here to stay. 
Um, you know, we will see a number of schools probably progressing. You're starting to see the trend now progressing to hybrid education, which is awesome. I'm, I'm all for it. You know, I, I highly believe in this model and I think we can leverage technology to maximize education. Um, but a lot of programs are just, you know, essentially converting their three year brick and mortar programs to th three year hybrid programs. I mean, this isn't addressing the student debt issue in, in my mind. It's, it's not helping us work towards opening up the opportunity for students to have the uh, financial uh, capabilities of going on to post-professional training. And, you know, to me, this is just, we're just spinning the wheels here. You know, I've heard John Child say, you know, <laughs> ad nauseum that if, if there weren't a limit to how long a program would be, DPT programs would probably be six, eight years, right? I mean, the sky's the limit on this stuff. And so I really feel like it, you know, and I'm passionate about this idea that we need to look at accelerated models. And I think the two year is, is where we need to do with this in mind. It's, it's, it's challenging. You look at a three year program. Now they're trying to figure out what to cut, how to make it work. You know, switching to it from a three year to a two year accelerated hybrid model takes a lot of work. So with this in mind, you know, if you're not getting the right kind of guidance and, and collaboration, you know, there's probably going to be programs that shut their doors. A lot of these smaller programs, potentially even larger programs, because let's face it, students at the end of the day, they don't care who's on faculty. They see two years and then they think, all right, I can go on and start making a living or I could go on and start doing post-professional training and not have to use my last year where I'm pretty much on internships and, you know, paying my college for basically sending me away, right? It's all about the money. And that's important. I mean, I, I'm right there with students. I was thinking the same thing. How can I start paying off my loans ASAP? And it's only getting more expensive. So I, I think, you know, with all these schools going through here, you know, good luck. But if you're not thinking, you know, accelerated hybrid, you know, uh, uh, your days are limited. I'll, I'll say it right now. Well, and I think, you know, I started thinking as I was listening to you, Mark, too, you know, this, you know, a lot of programs are starting to understand the need to, to, to maybe to stay competitive and to kind of meet the needs of students and to kind of go to the shorter model. But, but I do think the fallacy and the really the, the misconception about our two year accelerated hybrid model is that we just smush three years into two. Um, and, you know, so I'm a pediatric physical therapist. And so I'm going to kind of draw on that a little bit. So with kids, you know, when we talk about, you know, assistive devices with kids, a lot of times we kind of joke in our field that, you know, um, assistive device companies just take adult equipment and they just make it smaller and colorful and they say they shrink it and pink it, right? And the, the boom, it's for kids. And so I think what some people think that you do to make a two-year model is you just shrink it and link it, right? You just shrink it and link it. You put it online, easy. Um, and that's not, that's not how it works. I mean, again, I sort of said this before and I'll say it again you've got to take it together, take it apart and put it back together again in a way that makes really makes sense. And that's really, really intentional, not only for the hybrid piece, but to accelerate it. And so I, I you know, I think that that's where um, we might see some challenges in programs really kind of moving forward. I also, um, you know, I also think there's, there's a lot of other considerations. I mean, the graying of faculty is real, you know, it, again, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to go back to pediatrics, but in 2011, um, Joe Schreiber and colleagues put, um, published a paper in the Pediatric PT Journal, and at that time, they found that 60% of programs expected their pediatric faculty member to retire within the next 15 years. So we're at 2018 now. We're, we're halfway through that. Um, so more programs, when you already have really limited faculty, that's pretty... Um, you know, you, you start to wonder how that's sustainable. How can we have good quality faculty and qualified instructors um, really providing that content? Um, and so I think what's really exciting about this hybrid model and, and really hybrid education in general, when you really start looking at what you can do online um, and how we structure the, the labs and all of these things, is it's scalable. But that's what makes this really unique, too. It's not a lot harder to educate, you know, 100 students than it is to educate 70 students in this model, for example. And then once you really get, get it, start to get it right, it's not that hard to kind of look at another program and say, hey, look, we kind of have um, some curriculum going and a lot of these online resources. Let's collaborate. Let's create a little bit of, cons of a consortium. Of course, you have your faculty. We have ours. But these opportunities that are coming up, I mean, really, I think are uniquely, we are just uniquely situated to meet these needs of um, being able to educate more students, more diverse students, um, faster for less money 
with less of a faculty burden. Um, and that's, you know, those are all the kind of the big, hairy kind of problems facing sort of higher ed in general. I mean, you can't, you can't separate anything that's happening in PT from just the whole entire higher education kind of bubble that we may be experiencing right now anyway. And so I think that's what's, you know, these hybrid, our hybrid model, um, I think is really nicely situated to, to address some of those things. Yeah, they definitely solve a lot of problems to what you said, that's for sure. And and guys, it's been an absolute fantastic discussion, especially getting into learning education, but also kind of defining and kind of going through the hybrid methods and stuff, because I've definitely learned a lot from this episode as well. And I always love that when I get challenged, and I learn something. So I'm all for it. But this next question we like to ask every single guest at the end, because again, this show is called the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast. Now for this final question, if there's a point you wanted to reiterate from earlier or bring a brand new point that we didn't maybe talk about, we're all for it. Now the question is, if you could change one aspect of healthcare education, physical therapy or other healthcare provider related, which aspect would you change and how would you change it? Yeah, I think, you know, this is, uh, I was excited for this question, you know, kind of knowing how your podcasts kind of conclude, but I think the big piece, and, and I'm not going to go out on this, you know, limb here because this is kind of, you know, a, a consistent theme, but when you look at the way that we integrate the clinical faculty into our entry-level programs, and I'm not just talking physical therapy, I'm talking occupational therapy, I'm, you know, I'm talking medical, PA, what have you, but you know, in physical therapy, what I know the best, we always, you know, talk about, and CAPTI even identifies them as clinical faculty, but they're really not embedded. Do, do they know the curriculum? Do they know, do, do they really know the curriculum? No. I mean, you could, you could go in any program right now and, and do a survey of the CIs and say, you know, what, what class did they have before this? What, what did they have after this? What are they coming in with? You know, there's no consistency with what clinical instructors know. So I would really love to see DPT education start to um, look towards making clinical faculty CIs truly clinical faculty and actually looking at, uh, you know, the models, clinical models, and how we can encourage that. You know, the way it works right now with people working full time, 40 hours plus a week treating patients day in, day out, we have no time for teaching. You know, clinical faculty should be teaching. We should be rounding in the clinics, outpatient, inpatient, what have you. Why do we only have a one-to-one -one model of students coming out and they only have one-to-one -one person? Why don't we have several students to one CI? Why don't we have several residents to one fellow? Why aren't fellows being able to walk around and mentor? I blogged on this uh, for this month in, uh, at EIM, and we need to change our clinical models to make it look more like the medical model and have that type of environment so that we're not all just treating patients forever. It can be scalable, as Kendra said, the dirty word. It can be scalable and productive. There's models that are out there. We need to see more of it, and that will truly allow people to be faculty for programs and teach in the trenches where it's actually happening. That would be the ideal clinical role and the ideal academic role, I think. So for me, um, you know, I, I've, I've thought a lot about this question too, and um, kind of, again, knowing that, that this is how we get to end, um, I, I think it's hard for me to separate, you know, what I'd like to see in healthcare education and what I'd like to see in healthcare. So just, I'm just going to apologize in advance because I'm probably going to really just like kind of move between the two a little bit as I speak. Um, but the PD, and then maybe this is the pediatric PT in me. I mean, I'm a school-based PT. I'm a community-based PT. I've never worked in a medical model. I've always done community-based care. And so um, to me, I'd like to see P uh, healthcare education become more community-based. I mean, the reality is people don't live in hospitals and clinics. They need to be part of the team. Their families need to be part of the team. And I was really inspired by a, a TED Talk I watched recent, recently, which I would really encourage folks to watch. Um, Eric Dishman um, was the speaker, and the name of the talk was Healthcare Should Be a Team Sport. And he talks a lot about this. So I'm going to kind of echo a lot of his comments here as well. But, you know, um, he talks about in his TED Talk how healthcare, you know, brick and mortar healthcare probably just isn't that sustainable. And I can't, couldn't help but start to think about how that really parallels education. Um, you know, healthcare needs to be more personal. It needs to be more individualized families and, you know, individuals and, and their families don't need to be passive parts and passive participants in the healthcare system. And so what I really think is that by, by doing, I mean, in many ways, what we're already doing by de-emphasizing the brick and mortar education, you know, by, um, you know, by 
educating now a new generation of healthcare providers in this hybrid model that we may really be able to inspire them to think differently about healthcare, to think about how healthcare maybe doesn't have to be brick and mortar, butts and seat patient right in front of you, that we can leverage technology, um, that we can really help um, individuals take, take, um, risk, take again, just like we do with our students, right? That we can, you can be in control of your, of your education. You can be in control of your, of your healthcare. And so, you know, I, I really hope that we're really, um, by, by de-emphasizing again, kind of the butts and seats, brick and mortar by, by showing our students that we value their community and want them to be able to stay in their community and go back that we can then inspire them to have those same feelings about as they go out and provide care and they'll start to challenge, you know, why does this person have to come to a special building to a special room for me to do something that I could like probably teach them to do themselves or do over, you know, video conferencing um, or something like that. So I'm really hoping that we can, you know, really start to become more community-based and inspire our students to um, see the possibilities of how technology can now be leveraged to provide healthcare anywhere, just like now we're doing it to provide education anywhere. Yeah, those are two great answers, you guys. And I think, Kendra, you hit a hot button there with telehealth becoming, you know, the next wave of, of uh healthcare provision. And I think realistically, I mean, like you guys said, it's here now. I mean, we don't have to wait for it. It is here. So we might as well embrace it and do the best we can with it. Well, guys, thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure talking with you, Mark Mark and Kendra. If you guys wouldn't mind, uh, just let our audience know where they can find you online and on social media if they have any follow-up questions or just want to chat. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm on Twitter. I'm at Shep, S-H-E-P-D-P-T. You can find me there. I'm uh, actively engaged on there. And then uh, probably the next best way to reach out to me is through my cell phone number. It's 276-608-5603. Feel free to text or call. I'd love to chat and see how we can get you talking over some good discussion. Yeah, and I'm on Twitter as well. You can find me there at Kendra Ped PT. So K E N D R A P E D P T. Um, my number is eight one six seven two one nine four five nine. Again, love to text and chat. And um, of course, you can go to the Baylor DPT website and click on my um, profile there and get right to my email too, if you prefer email. So any of those ways are great. Well, perfect, guys. And thank you guys so much for all that you guys are doing, pushing the needle forward and for coming on the show to talk with us all for the and for our listeners this evening. It's always a pleasure. Thank you both. Thanks for having us. It was a, a lot of fun. It was awesome. Access to healthcare is one of the largest issues facing both providers and patients, as millions of people worldwide lack timely and affordable access to healthcare. Anywhere Healthcare, a telehealth platform, is a simple, low-cost option for providers and patients that eliminates the barriers to access to all kinds of healthcare. To find out more, check out anywhere.healthcare, which is available on our show notes. And if you use the code HET in all caps when you email to sign up, you'll save 25% off the total cost. Thank you for attending class today, and we hope that you learned something and gained value from the content. If you'd like to schedule office hours with us, feel free to add us on Twitter at HET Podcast, on Instagram, HET Podcast, on Facebook, the Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast, and the homepage, Healthcare Education Transformation Podcast.com. And for those of you following along in the syllabus, extra credit can be obtained by liking us, sharing us, and leaving a review. Let's continue our journey up Mount Educational Success as lifelong learners.